this goes to show you how much of an impact you can make on somebody. You can make videos and get, you know, found online. And you could be anywhere. The goal is to help, you know, connect a buyer and seller. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Ricky Caru. He is an investor, a speaker, and soon to be remembered, in my opinion, as a legend in the industry. In the past month, let's just say, I've finally figured out YouTube. I'm just now getting into a place where I feel like, okay, I think I understand how to grow on Instagram and YouTube. Well, is anyone bringing this to their attention the same way you are? Are they making the same points? Oh my gosh, these people don't even understand how this works. Representing all these buyers and sellers to, to pay for your life. They have no guarantee of how long it's gonna take until they get it. Your experience of creating content is different. You're just different. You're different all around. You post and you learn. Okay, on another episode of Soothing Semantics, I'm your host, Rafi Pinsky. Make sure to subscribe, like, share, leave your comments. I wouldn't be looking into this camera. For all of your real estate needs in South Florida, make sure to follow Rafi the Realtor on Instagram. Uh, sign up to my weekly newsletter. Credit to Ricky Caruth, who we have on the show today for all of your real estate needs. So without further ado, Ricky Caruth. What's up, man? How you doing, bro? Good, bro. Good, bro. It's really yeah. nice to finally meet you. Yeah. Yeah, we got over here in uh, Miami a couple days ago. Flew in, went to uh, the Sequarium. Sequarium yesterday. I mean, Miami's the only place you can go somewhere. It takes 30 minutes. It takes an hour and a half to go right back where you were. <laughs> it's great, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it was wild. So we were late to dinner and stuff. But yeah, man, we got a big event. We got 700 agents registered for this uh this event, we're actually shooting this inside the the room where the event's going to be later today, and uh, I'm excited. I'm excited too, man. It's been a good two years and change since I started following you. Uh huh. You know, so haven't met you yet. Finally, we get to meet. Yeah. And uh, I've just been implementing a lot of the things you've been talking about the weekly email, and uh, it's funny because I would have, you wouldn't think you'd have such a powerful agent in Alabama of all things. Uh -huh. You know, because I'm a New Yorker originally. Mm -hmm. And when you're from New York, you think that everything revolves around New York. Yeah. And so when you have someone in a state that's not as popular, but you're doing business at the level you are, it goes to show you that the hard work can be done anywhere. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I almost see it as an advantage because we don't have, you know, ten, twenty million dollar homes and you know. Um I don't know, man. It's uh with the way the internet is today. You know, I mean, you could literally be anywhere and really make an impact on people. This goes to show you how much of an impact you can make on somebody, regardless of where you are. I mean, it used to be you had to go to Hollywood to, you know, to try to try out, to, to do, um, you know, go and, and, you know, try to be a movie star or whatever. Now, you know, you can make videos and get, you know, found online and you could be anywhere. Yeah, that's crazy. So that's what's really cool, man. Is the internet made the world a, a smaller place? I mean, back in the day, it might have it would it would have been impossible, honestly, for somebody from New York to hear what this guy in Alabama is doing, and you know, be inspired by you know the strategies and implement like it. I mean, it would have pretty much not happened at all unless the Alabama agent became like a, a, a speaker and like, you know, ended up being on a stage or, you know what I mean? Like without social media, you know, I wouldn't be able to make the impact that I have because like when I got into the coaching side, um, I was still selling, you know, and I sold like five years as I was building the, the coaching brand. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do that without social media where I'm selling and building the brand, you know, cause like I could every day work on the brand by making videos and still sell real estate, you know, right, right. versus back in the day, you didn't have the option to make videos and post them online. So I'd have to, I would have had to like do a lot of traveling and speaking and write a book. You know what I mean? Like it, it was, that's the world we live in now is, you know, yeah, there's cool. so, there's so much opportunity. But it's so crazy that so many people don't implement it. And it's not even it's not even just older people. Because you know how it is. Older people are like, yeah. oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be on video, yada, yada. But even pe I'm 29. People in their 20s don't want to do it at all. Well, there's uh, the, the thing that people, it's almost like they don't want to make calls either, right? So they don't want to make calls. They don't want to do videos. Um, it's all kind of the same thing. Um, but what people need to understand is that 
it's not just about being on video, right? You get a video where you're not in the video uh, of houses where you're talking over the video or music over the video. You can do written word. You can write blogs. You can do a podcast where you're not even on video. Um, pictures. Um, the list goes on and on and on for things that you can do on social media to build your brand without even showing your face. Um, so I don't know. I, I it, it, It's kind of like, I don't want to be on video so they don't do social media at all. It's like you're giving up before you, you're, you're not even like looking for a solution. You know, what I found the true winners in the world do is they, 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 you know, they don't like, they see most people, you know, look at things like they're roadblocks when the winners in the world see them as just slight road bumps, right? They just kind of, it, it was like when I started with the weekly email, I didn't have business cards. I didn't have a website. You know, nowadays, like, people won't even, like, make a call unless they have a business card and that their business card right, made, right. right? Or their website perfect and all this stuff. It's like, I didn't even have any of that. I just went because the goal is to help, you know, connect a buyer and a seller. I mean, I wasn't worried about, you know, that was just bonus stuff if I had business cards and websites and stuff like that. Um, so, I, yeah, yeah. It's the age old thing, man. People just let anything stop them in their tracks, you know. Oh, you know, this is this isn't going to work or whatever. Or can't do that, and they just don't do it. Or if they're, I'm scared to make calls, so I'm just not going to do it. So not true. even going to try. It's like no, just give it a try. You know, you know same thing with social. Just start creating, dude. I've been doing social for six years now, and um, like literally, like literally. Like in the past month, let's just say, I've finally figured out YouTube. Right? That's a moment. Yeah, it, like in the last 30 days. Okay. Right? I've been doing it for six years. I'm about to hit 100,000 subs. I noticed that, right? Congrats. Yeah. But like in the last 30 days, I'm just now figuring out how to do YouTube. In what sense? What didn't, what didn't you know? How to create content people would watch. Mm-hmm. Um, how to make a thumbnail appealing, how to, what subjects to talk about, how to write the titles and what the demeanor and what the flow of the videos need to be to retain watchers. Well, I think it's mostly the, Ooh, you know, that, well, that, well, that, well, that's Instagram, (laughs) right? So that's Instagram. Um, and those do really well the the green screen article you know those are my biggest you know watched videos on instagram um but you know it's i figured out a little hack there right Mm -hmm. it's like find an intriguing article they're going to read the headline you know and they're like oh what does ricky have to say about this as i'm saying ooh, (laughs) so they're like really like okay what the hell's fixing to happen and then i break down some you know great data they probably didn't think about or whatever my opinions are um you know, that's a little hack. Same thing with Instagram stories. I realized that if I erased all yesterday's stories and started fresh, wrote like a paragraph on a story where people had to put their thumb on it to stop the story to read it, then Instagram would fire it through the algorithm, right? And then if I could add something at the end where it makes them DM me too, where if they put their thumb on it, they're spending time on that piece of action story, and then they're DMing me, then Instagram's like, oh, and they blow Instagram blows it up. So my Instagram story views went from two thousand to twenty thousand or twenty five thousand, like that. Just just realizing that that's a hack. Um, so same thing with YouTube, like and like I'm just figuring all this stuff out after six years of literally posting every day on every platform, and I'm just getting to a place where I feel like I kind of know what I'm doing, to a point where I feel like I can actually grow. You know what I mean? So that's what that's what's interesting is that a lot of people are scared to do social and all this. And I'm six years in of posting every day and I'm just not getting into a place where I feel like, okay, I think I understand how to grow on Instagram and YouTube. Most you know? people would never have the fortitude to go six years. I think that's really the biggest issue is they're afraid of the judgment and they're they have no guarantee of how long it's gonna take until they get it. You know, I've been doing the podcast for three years, man. You know, I've been posting weekly episodes more or less nonstop for three years, you know, and there's a lot of things I'm getting. There are things I still, you know, need time to learn, but it's like, I, I just know that these things are so valuable. It's crazy. Well, 
you know, I posted content for six years that I feel like suck. You know, the content sucks. Mm -hmm. I feel like it sucks. Um, I feel like a lot, you know, 99% of the content I've posted over the last six years sucks. Um, you know, you look back at it and I'm like, damn, that sucks. Um, in one way, it boring, like what? Do yeah, you think? just not interesting, not, um, not, not good editing, not good hooks. Um, you know, the whole nine yards, right? Just bad content. You have more enthusiasm, a lot more. I remember in the earlier videos, it was a lot more monotone and suddenly you started to become a lot more bubbly. And well, I think, I think in the beginning I was bubbly. I think that I, then I went kind of, you know, monotone, you go through waves, like you reinvent yourself. You know, you're a different person on social media. I say every six months, I say you're a different person. You're putting out different content. Your tone's different. Your mannerisms are different. You know, your knowledge is different. Your experience of creating content is different. You're just different. You're different all around. Every six months, you're basically reinventing yourself on social. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you go back to older videos and stuff and, and now, I'll look back at the videos I'm doing now and be like, I, I think I'll look back at the videos I'm making right the second and be like, those are okay. Because the videos I'm going to make next year are going to be better. And so the videos I'm making now, I'm like, I'm going to look back. See, the videos I, I made in the past, I'm like, those suck. The videos I'm making now, I think I'll look back in a year or two and say, those were okay. Right? And the videos I'm going to make in a couple of years, I think will be good, not great. And so, I, and so I'm going to be working towards trying to make great videos, right? Which won't happen for another three to five or That's more. Fair. Okay. Well, it's also, it's good that you have, it's good that you kind of have the ability to do it, even if you're not perfectly happy with it. But I think that's the key. You have to. Yeah. And part of it too is, is like the content I say is sucks back in the day. I liked it when I posted it. You know what I mean? So that, that's part of it is like, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know? So you 100%. just, you post and you learn. 100%. I, I do want to, I want to talk about this whole thing with NAR though. Uh huh. What do you think's going to be? I mean, for people who don't know, just to, just to kind of be quick with it, uh, you know, there was this lawsuit where it was in Missouri, Kansas City, I'm pretty sure, right? And uh, long story short, the sellers ended up paying, well, this is standard, but the sellers paid the buyer's agents and the buyer, the buyer's agent negotiated about $10,000 less on the, on the price. And so they felt, why should we pay an agent who's working against us? So now there's this whole long suit and, uh, you know, now people... Well, basically what it is is that it's, it's not even about an incident, right? It's mm -hmm. about the general way that the industry um, operates in terms of the listing agent negotiates a commission and then out of what they negotiate that commission with the seller, they basically the buyer agent gets a portion of that when, when they when they bring a buyer to the table that they're representing. And what this group of sellers are saying is, is, hey, we shouldn't have had to pay that out of the purchase price, right? And to me, it's kind of like, well, number one, you agreed to all this. Number two, it's the same thing to me as a subcontractor. Like, you know, you, a, a roofer comes and bids your job, say for 15000 and then they pay a subcontractor 12000 to actually do the work, mm -hmm. right? And they pocket 3000 It's almost the same thing, you know? Like, we negotiated to sell your property for 5 or 6%. What do you care what I do with the money, right? I'm, I'm using the money to entice all the agents in the area and give them incentive to bring us a buyer. And so a group of sellers saying, we shouldn't have had to pay that. We want our money back. Right. It's a refund lawsuit. They want their money back. The sellers want their money back. There's about 250 plus thousand transactions during the period of time that's that's under trial right now. And uh, you've got the CEOs of Remax and Keller Williams and uh, Home Services of America, Caldwell Banker, uh, got deposition um, and many, many others. Right. And it, it, I've been following it every day. It's a three week trial that started this week. And the way that I actually view the whole thing is that it's a group of owners that don't understand how the business works. If you take, and what they're trying to do is take it, make it to where it's illegal to pay the buyer agent out of the listing side commission, where it's viewed as a kickback, where the buyer agent commission can't be on the HUD. You, you can't pay the buyer agent at all out, out of the deal anywhere. And so 
the buyer will have to pay their own agent, um, which will, you know, completely flip the industry upside down, which in turn will create a lot of opportunity for the opportunist out there. Uh, we'll also lose a lot of agents and the commission pool will be reduced dramatically, 30, 40, 50%. But there was a study that agents steer clients away from lower buyer commission offered properties, offered listings, right, for sale. Right. I've never steered anybody. I don't know anybody that has, That's but I guess, it, I guess it happens, right? There was a survey Inman did where it's about 50-50. People think they steer. People don't think they steer 50-50. But there was a study where the lower the buyer agent commission offered, the longer the property sat on the market. When that commission got below 2%, 75% of the properties that offered less than 2% didn't sell, right? And so it's like, if that's the case and you're trying to take buyer commission totally out of the equation, you're hurting yourself, seller, by not offering an incentive for the thousands of agents in your area to bring you a buyer. There's not really gonna be many buyer agents, honestly. And the buyer, a lot of the buyers who don't want to pay an agent out of their own pocket are going to kind of fend for themselves, not be represented. It's going to be a mess, right? You're just, you're really going to screw up the whole thing. Right now, it's running like a, a well-oiled machine. Is, where, anyone ta- is anyone bringing this to their attention the same way you are? Are they making these same points? Who? Bringing it to whose attention? To whoever has to deal, whoever is finalizing this this case. Not really. Um you know, I've, I've, I've been reading and, and I've been, I've been covering this every day on my YouTube, um, every day in court, I've been going through the notes and, you know, explaining everything to everybody and giving my thoughts and stuff. And from what I can tell, like, um, you know, I don't, I don't, the notes I hear, it, it makes me think, man, what are these lawyers on the defendant side? You know, NAR is in the suit, NAR. Uh, Keller Williams, Remax, all these companies, it's like, I, I hear the, I mean, I'm, I'm reading the notes and I'm thinking, we need to fire the, <laughs> we need to fire these lawyers. What is going on? You know what I mean? It's insane. We heard from two of the plaintiffs who are the property owners that are in on the class action that are asking for their money back. We heard from two of those so far. Well, actually four of those so far, we've got notes on two of them. And uh, when you read it, it's like, oh, my gosh, these people don't even understand how this works. Uh, one um, plaintiff's mom is, was an agent for 30 years, you know, and, and she's like, I'm doing this for her and I'm doing this for my kids because my kids are becoming to the age where they're going to start buying homes. And I'm thinking, you don't pay a commission when you buy, lady, number one. Right. And uh, do you want to go back? And she said, I know my mom worked really, really hard for her clients and stuff. And I'm, I'm thinking... Um, and she's like, she's like, I'm doing this for my kids. And I'm like, yeah, just like your mom did this for you by going out there and being an agent and making all this money, representing all these buyers and sellers to, to pay for your life. You're right. To, to, so you could be in that position. You know, so you're going to tell your mom to go refund all those buyer agent commissions back to those sellers. Right. It's, it's wild, man. Like they don't get it for sell by owners on average sold for like 30% less on their own than, than they would have with an agent. You know, that's like real stats. Um, it's like they want to save 20, 30%. They want to save 6%. You know, they're going to lose 20, 30% to save 6%. You know what I mean? Like if you take all this out of the equation and you run it like the wild, wild west and have buyers where they ever have to pay their own agent or not have one, it's going to be a mess. Mm-hmm. It honestly is. And here's the thing. I think a lot of people know that, Right. Um, you know, I don't know what people are thinking, but like the plaintiff's lawyer, for example, right? Michael Ketchmark, like, uh, man, it's just like, do you understand? Like, I don't think you understand the industry. And w- what I really feel like it is, is you got a group of owners that don't understand how it works and how beneficial the current system is. And they went to a lawyer not understanding how it works, saying this is unfair practice, right? And so then the lawyer says, oh, we got a case here against these corporations that are worth billions. And so I believe it's a typical lawyer situation where it's like, let's go make this big case and let's go after all these people for all these millions, all these companies for all these millions. So now you've got, I believe, owners that understand how it works and how great the current model is with paying buyer agents out of the listing agent commission, a lawyer who's, who, ta- who looks at that and says, let's go make some money. And in order to make the money, 
you're going to have to change how we operate in the industry. So for me, I look at it, I'm thinking he's taking advantage of the property owners that don't understand the, the way the industry works. And he himself probably doesn't understand how it works no, and how beneficial not. the current system is. Right. But, but they got dollar signs in their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I believe that I believe it's just like, maybe they believe deep down in their heart, this is unfair practice. But if they understood that it's not unfair practice, all this is negotiable. Like the lady that went on the stand that her mom was an agent. She was like, she was like the buyer agent got 20% of my equity. Right. Like some say she bought it for a hundred, sold it for 150, for example, you know, and she got, you know, 10,000, you know, 20% of her, you know, above what she paid for. That's okay. what I'm, I'm guessing she was talking about. And then you add the other buyer agent. I mean, the, the listing agent commission there, it's 40%, right? Uh, 20 and 20 is, is 40. Um, and it's, and she's like, she's like, I just, um, I was so sad or I were at sad when I realized we were going to get so little or something like that. And I was thinking, number one, like, you don't have to use an agent. Right. You can sell it on your own. You can also negotiate the commission. You can also go to a discount brokerage, right? There's a lot of different options. Like, you don't have to use an agent. It's not mandatory, mm -hmm. right? And all this is negotiable. That That's what's wild about this whole thing. So we'll see it how, how it all what turns do you, out. Where do you think it's going to go? Do you think it's going to go in the favor of... of of well, everyone really, or do you think it's well? An analyst group says it's a 50 50 on this trial, but what's interesting is there's another trial early next year, the Mora case, and it's it's the exact same case, it's going to be in Illinois, and um, it's going to be early next year, you know, I don't know exactly when, probably Q1. And um, they say that's a 75 percent chance of you know the plaintiffs winning and um, you know, this whole thing getting flipped on its head, but but the thing is, is that. If the plaintiffs win either one of those cases, uh, the defendants will will um, appeal, right? They're going to appeal it, and it'll be a, you know, it'll go through the appeal process, which drags everything out for years. Um, it's going to be drug out, and then if, in fact, it's going to become a law where a buyer agent commission is viewed almost like a kickback, and it cannot be on the HUD, you know, you cannot pay them, out of the listing site commission legally, um, then that has to go through a, a, a big process, you know what I mean, to get to where it's actually a rule and actually a law. So, like, if this, in fact, does go down, it would take a long, in my opinion, like five, ten years to actually make it to where we had to start operating under these new, new rules or whatever. So it's going to be so telegraphed. You're going to have plenty of time to, to realize or to figure out how, to deal with it in your business. Um, but it's going to have it's like, there's going to be so much opportunity because I mean, number one, you're going to have like these buyer agents that emerge who specialize in only buyers, right? People that are like, they advertise, like I only work with buyers and do not work with sellers. I'm a buyer specialist. And they're going to be like work operating like a lawyer, in my opinion, you know, where they take a big retainer up front. They're going to have big clients, uh, clients that want representation, that are doing these big deals um, and uh, there's going to be a big market for buyer agents, right? So it's going to uh, kind of have the split. It's going to be very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you'll have people that work buyers and sellers, of course. Um, but then you're going to have a lot of buyers who just don't have the money or just elect not to pay. They're probably going to avoid, they're going to try to avoid doing it, especially in the middle market. Yeah, where, yeah, in the lower end market and stuff like that where people can barely come up with a down payment and all this stuff. Um, there may be like financing um, products that come out that include the buyer agent commission into the loan, which again, now the property is going to have to appraise. So now you're still getting the 3% or whatever it is out of the appraised value, right, which is what you're doing now, right, back, right, right back where we were. Yeah. Um, if a buyer agent isn't, isn't included, it's not like the seller is going to take 3% less than appraised value because the buyer agent is involved. They're still going to get the maximum amount. This isn't going to change prices. You know, the whole thing is actually a mess. You know, the current model is the best model. I think maybe what, what the best solution is, is to have better disclosure um, to the buyers and sellers about how it works, right? I think that there should be just better disclosure. That's really what should happen at the end of the day. You should leave it like it is and just have better disclosure to the consumers 
um, you know, well, look, dis, you know, disclosure documents and explain, you know, actually explain how this thing works and the fact that it is negotiable, and uh, so on and so forth. It's 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 crazy. It's so crazy. I mean, what do you think is going to happen though? I think either way, though, listing agents are going to be key. Well, for the listing agents, if this were to go down like this, it's probably going to reduce their commission to 3%. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you're going to list them for 3%. Um, and and even two in some markets, right? So two or 3%. And then you're going to be doing double the work a lot of times because the buyers are going to come straight to you. Right. So now you got to deal with the buyers showing on the property. You're going to have to have a buyer agent or a showing agent or something that's handling all that, um, you know, and probably multiple of them. If you got a bunch of listings, um, you have to pay those agents something, right? So you're going to have to be dealing with the buyers, looking at properties. When they bring the offer, you're going to have to be probably handling all that as well if they're not if they're not going to pay their own agent or have a lawyer draw up stuff. So definitely more work for the listing agent. Alone. Yeah, so so you're looking at the listing agent doing twice the work, dealing with yep. two parties yep. instead of one yep. for half the money. Because normally when you work both sides, you get the full five or six percent. What was agreed to, it's like <laughs> you, you get the full commission. That's what they are hiring. That's, that's the price that they're willing to, to pay you to sell the property. You know, what do you care what I do with the money? You know, I'm, I'm using it to incentivize. It's basically look at it as marketing. You know, I'm I'm incentivizing all the agents to to sell the property. Right. When you take that away, you don't have a bunch of other agents out there working to try to find the buyer. It's a, it's definitely going to create less of an incentive for agents to do the to do the job at the highest level. It's just what it is. Yeah, it's going it, to if, if it goes through, it'll it'll change a lot of stuff. But it, I mean, I don't. You know, we'll lose a lot of agents. That's right. A, well, the that's end, the industry will cr it will crush. A lot of agents right out of the business. We already lose agents just because interest rates went up. I mean, could right. you imagine if buyer agent commissions went away? It would just we would lose half the agents in the industry, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, but but there it would still be an amazing uh, career, an amazing industry to be in, uh, extremely lucrative, and a great um, platform to you know to to become a millionaire and leverage into other you know. Other are the other verticals. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna keep in touch. I mean, I'm gonna continue to follow you as always, and just get your your insights and everything. I would have loved to. I think uh, we probably have to get ready for this, right? So let's uh, let's wrap this up. Yeah. Um, I didn't even fully introduce you, but if if you don't know who Ricky Caruth is, make sure to follow him on Instagram and YouTube. I already know you so well; it just didn't even occur to me. I just went right into the episode. So, guys, thank you for watching another episode of Soothing Semantics. I hope you enjoyed. There's so much more information that you can check out on Ricky's channels. And obviously for all of your South Florida real estate needs, make sure to check out Rafi the Realtor. Sign up for the weekly newsletter. Also make sure to go onto YouTube and look up Ricky Caruth weekly newsletter because this is something he emphasizes all day long. It has really, really helped my business. I highly, 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 I don't even highly suggest, it's an understatement. You need to get a weekly email uh, set up on your business. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share. Ricky, thanks again for coming. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Cool, Until bro. next time.